Welcome, my name is Jeff Lackey. I'm the host of the show of Growing Your Business with People. This is a podcast focused on business leaders who are looking to find the way that they need to grow their business with the one and only asset that they really have, which is their people. Today, I have Dr. Mike Hallisey. Dr. Hallisey, I'll be referring to him as Mike most of the podcast today because that's why I know him as uh, most of the years uh, that I've known him. He's here to talk to us about employee burnout. I have the distinct pleasure of being able to interview Mike because he's not only an assistant professor of healthcare administration at the Mayo Clinic and an adjunct professor at A.T. Still University. He has his PhD in organizational science, is a PA, a researcher, and an educator, and has uh, experience in spine surgery, orthopedic surgery, neurology, and emergency medicine, among others. But his one of his passion areas, and the reason that he's on the show today, is to talk to business leaders about burnout in the workplace. Now, as a CEO, you have faced down the global pandemic. You're in the midst of a supply chain meltdown. You're finding you're you're facing into extreme hiring challenges. You have a looming recession, and you are oftentimes having your leaders and possibly yourself very unprepared with the information and formal training around how to support your employees and even yourself whenever you're faced with these dire and extremely stressful environments. What does that mean? That's a recipe for disaster because that creates, as we've already seen across the globe, extreme cases of burnout and major mental health problems. Recently, in a McKinsey article, they, they talk about in the May 27th of this year article, I'm going to read from it. It says, many employers have responded by investing more into mental health and well-being than ever before. Across the globe, four in five HR leaders report that mental health and well-being is a top priority for their organization. Many companies offer a host of wellness benefits such as yoga, meditation app subscriptions, well-being days, training on time management and productivity. In fact, it's estimated that nine in 10 organizations across the world offer some form of wellness program. But as laudable as these efforts are, we have found that many employers focus on individual level interventions that remediate symptoms rather than resolve the causes of employee burnout. Employing these types of interventions may lead others to overestimate the impact of their wellness programs and benefits and to underestimate the critical role of the workplace in reducing burnout and supporting employee mental health and well-being. So today we have Mike. Mike uh, is here to allow us to benefit from his years of experience in research and practice at the Mayo Clinic. Mike's going to offer us insights into what the research says, what experience has taught him, and provide you with very practical and tangible ways on how to lead in this in this crisis. Welcome, Mike, to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, so, well, it's just an honor to have you, and um, yeah. I'm thrilled to pieces. Uh, who would have thought that you know, thirty some years ago, looking at the the versions of ourselves right. back then, that this would well, be in this we... position? So, yeah, exactly. So kind of sharing a little with, bit of what, about yourself and kind of maybe how you became interested in employee burnout? Sure. So I have been in practice at Mayo Clinic since 2001. Um, I finished my doctorate in 2012. And I worked with uh, Tate Shanafelt, who is uh, Dr. Shanafelt's kind of regarded as one of the top experts on the planet in physician burnout. And we became very interested in other providers, you know, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, nurses, paramedics, and levels of burnout um, in them. And having had suffered some of the symptoms of burnout myself over the years, it became sort of a, a little bit more of a passion of mine to try to figure out how do we sort of minimize this um, and expand productivity, expand efficiency, and increase employee satisfaction. Wow. It's, so it's very personal to you yeah. about what this, uh, you know, what burnout means. Bad Advertising Agency is entering our 100th year of business. 
From day one, we have specialized in recruitment advertising, and today, we develop fully digital strategies across programmatic advertising, search engine marketing, and social media. With 100 years of experience and knowledge across every industry, we're ready to help our clients navigate what's next. To learn more, visit us at badad.com. You know, you said that um, one of the things is that you feel like you've experienced burnout. What, whenever you were going through burnout yourself, as I mean, think about it as a leader, how did you recognize that you were experiencing burnout and, and what did you do in that moment whenever you felt like you were, you were faced on kind of that precipice of uh, real professional pain? Sure. A lot of it manifested in myself more as uh, one of the, the key pieces in burnout, which separates it a little bit from some other mental health disorders is emotional exhaustion. So, and uh, you, you lose your ability to empathize and to really reflect with other people. And um, that was tough when I realized, it took me actually a little while to realize it. And then I kind of came to the conclusion, wow, I, um, I need to work on this. So one of the things that helped me a lot was talking to other people who had gone through it. Um, trying to focus on smaller parts of the discussion with people and um, trying to redirect things for myself. So, but, you know, I mean, burnout itself is really manifests itself as depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and um, decreased effectiveness at work. It can often be associated with depression and anxiety, but they aren't necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to be associated with depression or anxiety. So you said depersonalization. What were those three again? Would you mind sharing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and a low personal accomplishment, which leads to kind of decreased efficiency. Those are kind of the three hallmarks that we see um, in professional burnout. So depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and low personal accomplishment. Yeah. So. If you're a leader today and you either see these, see these, uh, these symptoms mm -hmm. in yourself or those around you, a little alarm bell should be going off inside your head that says, you know, right. uh, you know, hailing back to the very old show, Danger Will Robinson Danger, right? Right. Uh, I, this, I, is, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually was on a, a plane not too long ago to actually give a presentation, ironically enough, on burnout and was sitting next to an attorney who was a prominent real estate attorney. And we talked for a little bit and she said, you know, her job was exhausting at times, but she said she had noticed that employees would come to her in the office with questions, you know, the paralegals or other attorneys. And in the past, she had always been very willing to answer and wanted the engagement. But she said now she still was able to put a professional face forward, but inside she said, I'm like rolling my eyes and almost kind of disgusted, like, oh, God, please, can't you figure this out for yourself? And she said, when I realized I was doing that, that really concerned me because this is my law firm. This is my practice. Mm -hmm. How do I get past that? But the important part was she realized it, and other people may not. They may actually get to a point where they're much more callous, indifferent, lower empathy, and not really recognize that they're going through it. The thing I'm picking up also, Mike, is that I think of an organization and, and I, and I always reminded of uh, some of the Sindelani training that talks about mm -hmm. shadow of the leader, right? Right. So that shadow that you cast, others will follow, right? And if you stop right. showing empathy, if you sh stop making things more depersonalized, you, uh, you, you're showing up emotionally exhausted, right. then, then that may actually transfer to your employee base and through your whole organization. So Correct. fast, right? Hmm? Correct. And I mean, the, the statistics currently on burnout, if you look at all occupations, is somewhat staggering. 28% of employees report having burnout symptoms very often or always. That's a third almost of your workforce that is burnt out. 48%, um, almost half, report sometimes. More people who have burnout are more likely to call off sick, 63% absenteeism rate, 23% more likely to go to the ER or try to use emergency services. Um, there's even higher levels of suicidal ideation and depression. And um, 
you can reduce it by doing lots of things, but first you have to sort of recognize it. You know, somebody who's saying stuff like, I always feel like I'm at the end of my rope. I, I, I just, I don't feel like I have anything more to give. Those are big signs of emotional exhaustion. Uh, people who are having an increase in customer complaints um, or employee, other employee complaints, if they say, God, you know, he's just really over the last few months really becoming a jerk. That's something that leadership in the organization needs to be able to recognize because if you don't identify it, it will continue to fester. It's kind of like a, a small infected abscess. If you don't take care of it, it it's not going to just go away. So. And that doesn't help by your boss coming to you and saying, hey, you need to treat other employees better and, and all that, like, or, or treat your customers better. Like that's that's the symptom. That's a sign that we have a problem. That's not the, right. that's not the root cause of the problem. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Eighty three percent of employees across the country are affected in some way by burnout, whether it's them personally, a family member, they're they're somehow affected by it. And uh, it tends to be much higher in our generation, Gen Xers and millennials, because we tend to be more workaholics. And um, in a recent Gallup poll, 84% of millennials reported some level of burnout at their current job. I was talking to somebody today or yesterday, and I won't reveal anything about the conversation, but the person said that every day they go into the work nervous. And they, and they like, they're shaking and they're yeah. like, and they said, every, they said, that's not unique to me. The person was saying that's everybody on the team, the whole wow. organization, the whole office feels yeah. that way all the time. And There's I'm some like, kind of failure of leadership there. So, yeah. and it's so hard because it's a high performing organization, right. right? At the current, at the present time, it's high performing, but I'll tell you, Having, having led through periods of burnout and having teams that have experienced it themselves, that is, a temp, is very tenuous, that performance, because as soon as they start really suffering the impact, yeah. there's no, I mean, there's, it, I don't know, I don't even know how you recover once, I mean, because people start leaving. Well, that's why it's so important to recognize it early and so important to try to set up processes before we reach yeah. those because when burnout reaches that really advanced state, man, that's that's a much tougher nut to crack and much diff more difficult to treat. This podcast is brought to you by Paradox AI, also known as Olivia, recruiting's most advanced AI assistant. I used Paradox at my previous organization and their team helped us create a candidate concierge experience that ensured a fast hiring process that still felt very human. We literally hired hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom were critical healthcare workers needed during the pandemic. She would let them know we had an interview or offer waiting and would help them navigate onboarding processes. Olivia made the experience easy and fast two essential ingredients in recruiting great people. It's not just me. Organizations like McDonald's, General Motors, Unilever, and L'Oreal use this technology to create engaging and fast candidate experiences. Go to Paradox.ai to learn more about the amazing things Paradox and Olivia can do for you. As a business leader, you've had a you know, kind of take your own medicine and practice what you preach, right? right. And, and, and practice research. Give us the benefit of both the research and also your experience and, and, and maybe give us some things that we could do and maybe a few examples would be great. Sure, sure. So one of the things is, you know, I'm, a, I'm an avid golfer. And one of the things you talk about in the golf swing is matchups. You know, you have to have a matchup. If you move this way, then you have to have a consequential move that goes this way. Well, I think that applies to more than just that situation. It applies to your work setting because you have to match people with their talents, skills, and abilities to the workload that they can handle. So there was actually in this same poll, they found that people that worked more than 50 hours per week were almost two times as likely to experience burnout as people who worked less than 50 hours a week. So managing people's workloads, you know, the, the whole, hey, I'm a tough guy, I'm gonna work 80 hours a week, sounds great. 
but it's a recipe for struggles down the road. And 50 hours a week in corporate America is it's nothing. It, it, that's like the, that's like the, that's your slow week, right? That, that's that. I mean, people actually take pride in saying, well, I, you know, ha ha ha. I only worked a 70 hour week this week, you right. know? Right. But inside mm -hmm. they may be dying. Right. Because you, you're, you're, you're losing that work life balance and that work life, what we call in burnout research, WLI or work life integration. And you've got to be able to integrate your personal life with your work life in order to be really a successful human. Well, that, that is some really good insight. So if you're seeing as a leader, if you're seeing a bunch of people working great in the 50 mm -hmm. hours a week, work with your HR, check, start looking at the, you know, the check in, check out, uh, talk to them, you know, sure. just have conversations, see what you're hearing. And if you're seeing that, just say, Hey, listen, we may be, we may be getting nice productivity kick out of that, right. but there's going to be a price that we may have to pay for that, that I'm not willing to pay longer term. Right. You know, and I'd like, so, to, I'd like to avoid that. One of the key kind of research focuses in burnout is a lot of the work has been done by a, a researcher named Maslach, M-A-S-L-A-C-H. And in fact, the Maslach burnout inventory is a quiz that you can administer to your employees. And it's sort of considered the gold standard in burnout research as far as determining levels of burnout. And the areas that they found um, that really impacted and drove burnout, workload, which we just talked about, managing the workload. And this has been more difficult with the pandemic because we have companies that are laying off multiple employees. And I talked to somebody a few weeks ago who was a patient of mine who said they've been just struggling because they laid off three employees in his division. And rather than hiring people right away, they just kind of dumped the entire workload on him. And he goes, I, I can't do it. Now I'm going to yell that because I'm not submitting these reports in time and I'm not getting this done. But he goes, I, you're asking me to do the work of three people, which isn't really possible. Um, another big one is, and this is more difficult, uh, especially in um, companies where maybe you're, you're focused on product, production, um, is autonomy. So employees have to feel they have some say in their daily work life routine. So one of the things we've implemented and some businesses are recommended was, you know, if your employees are able to work from home, perhaps allow them one flex day per week. They can choose one day per week that perhaps they want to work from home. And that allows them a little bit more time with the family, allows them a little more control over their schedule and over what they do, which is huge. So when you don't have autonomy, you feel like you have no control. You feel like you have no ability to self-determine. And then you start to get frustrated and well, work doesn't care. Right? They won't let me do this and you know, and then rewards and rewards, the lack of any reward or feedback is another driver of burnout. So if you're not being told, hey, you're doing a good job, um, having feedback that's positive, um, perhaps bonuses if the company is able to provide them at times, you know, a lack of a sense of community can drive burnout. So we want people to feel like they belong in the company and the company cares about them and it's a community. When you feel that you're isolated or alone, that only furthers that depersonalization concept that we talked about. And then fairness, respect, and value alignment. You know, you've got to have your values align with the company's values. So if you're someone who prefers the nonprofit world and you're very driven with just helping people, going to work for a Wall Street company probably won't work well for you because your values are not going to align with theirs. Mm -hmm. So what I heard was workload, getting mm -hmm. the workload balance, right? Aligning with the person's capabilities, mm -hmm. knowledge, the skills, their abilities, autonomy, allowing them to have some say so in, in either the environment or the work right. itself to, you know, maybe, maybe you tell them the what that needs to get done and, and they, they could determine the how, right? Maybe Correct. give them some autonomy over the how. Uh, rewards and recognition, really taking time to, to recognize people for the efforts, give them credit where credit is due, right? Um, and saying, hey, you might be a quiet person, you don't toot your own horn, and right. maybe you don't even want somebody 
publicly announcing because you're kind of a private person, but sure. maybe a one-on-one -on -one in that one-on-one -on -one meeting saying, you know what, what you did the other day, I just want you to know I saw it and I really appreciated what you did because that made the world a difference for us and our team. And I might, I'm not sure if everybody else noticed it, but I wanted you to know that I noticed it. Right. Right. And then fairness alignment is that fairness, respect, company alignment to say, you know, do I think that this is a place where people are being they're They're being fair. I might not like everything that happens, sure. but I know that it's not unfairly bent toward one group or another. It's Correct. it's being played in a way that is is respectful. honest and has high integrity and respectful. Yeah, correct. And then also acknowledging concerns. So if you have an employee that brings a concern forward, not dismissing it out of hand, not kind of sweeping it under the rug, not ignoring it, but addressing it and let them know that you are listening. So I think one of the biggest things for the leadership and leaders are crucial. So leadership is crucial to managing burnout and preventing it because the leadership is the one that can help set some of these processes in place. And it's really about listening. In fact, that same survey found six, that burnout was 62% less likely if the manager listened to the employee discussion of work-related problems. So if the, if the employee came in and said, look, I'm having this issue, and the manager genuinely sat down and listened to them and documented it and really took the time to, to talk to them, burnout was significantly less likely. So I'm going to share a little bit, a little pearl here for the mm -hmm. audience. And I, I'm glad you brought this up, the, the, the listening, because it's a passion of mine in leadership. I always say that if a leader isn't a listener, they're not really a leader. Right. And what I tell leaders is said, there's, there's, a, there's two benefits that you get from listening. The first is, is you're meeting an unmet need that is probably one of the biggest unmet needs in the world is that the sense of feeling listened to. And Mike, I'm so glad you brought that up because there is a need in our organizations and just in our culture right. to hear other people and take the time and appreciate. You may or may not agree. It really doesn't matter whether you do, right. but that you hear them and that you can appreciate not only what they're telling you on the surface, but they're, that they take that you give them the space to tell you a little bit more about why, you know, what they're concerned about and why they're concerned. And validate their concerns, repeat it back to them, let them know that you really heard it, that you, it's a valid, you, even if you disagree with it, you think, God, they're in here again with this, validating it and letting them know that, hey, I heard you and I, I understand that you are really concerned about this is huge. And what you said there was repeat it back to them. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that if you repeat it back to them, sometimes what a person does is they give you what's what I call a teaser message. Right. They're, they're just checking to see if you're listening. And when you play it back to them, they go, okay, Mike's exactly. listening to me. Exactly. Now I'm going to take that next level down, which is a little bit more where the meat of what I really wanted to talk about was, but I wasn't going to share that unless Mike actually cared about what I was going to say. Exactly. And that gets to you as a leader where the benefit starts to happen because you get to learn things that you probably wouldn't learn and, and understand and appreciate things about people that you might not otherwise appreciate. Sure. And that's a, they, they call it the black swan in some circles, right? It's that information that that person's holding that they won't release unless they have a listener on the other side. And you as a leader probably need that information either for the benefit of the employee, say if it's a burnout issue, mm -hmm. or the benefit of your organization, because maybe it's something really big and substantial that you should know about. And that employee is not going to trust just anybody with it unless they have somebody a, a good listening ear on the other end of that conversation. 100%. I, I'm so glad you brought that up, Mike. This podcast is brought to you by 7-Step a leading global workforce solutions provider that offers recruitment process outsourcing, MSP services to manage the flexible workforce, including suppliers and contractors, and total talent solutions for managing the entire permanent and flexible workforce supply. Their people are great, and so is their technology, particularly their Surveo Insights data and intelligence platform. It's really cutting edge, not only in how it brings your talent data together, 
but in how it draws deep, detailed, predictive intelligence. It's really like a crystal ball for your talent data. I used 7-Step at my previous two organizations, and their team helped us to launch a full-service RPO to staff healthcare workers, customer service reps, IT professionals, data science and engineering, digital design teams, along with aerospace engineers and manufacturing workers. Their talent analytics put data at my fingertips, which allowed me to see around corners and strategically plan for frequent and volatile market changes, including a global pandemic where we had to hire literally hundreds of thousands of people. Their deep knowledge and exceptional integrity allowed me to rely on them as a trusted partner across multiple lines of business. Go to 7stepRPO.com to learn more about the powerful things 7step can do for you. Give us an example, maybe in your own practice or in, in, in the construct of where you've, you've had to maybe employ some of these, um, uh, some of these, these methods of avoiding burnout. What did, how have you used it uh, within your organization? Sure. So we do do some things like um, we have scheduled with our administrative staff and providers, you know, monthly meetings where they can actually sit down and for an hour, anything goes. Employees are allowed to say anything they want, you know, and it's not judged. It's just really allowing them to vent. Um, they sometimes give out small rewards. You know, one of the other things that we we talked about as a driver and what we started doing in our, our spine area is community. So a lack of community. One of the things that's happened since the pandemic is that a lot of workers are now working remotely. You might be surprised to know that burnout rates among remote workers are actually higher than those who come into the company. Wow. Not much, 1% higher, but 29% mm -hmm. of remote workers felt very, that they were experienced burnout very often. And it's because of that isolation from the company. So, and, and I'm not saying remote work is bad. So a lot of our nursing staff that answers the phones and takes a lot of the nursing messages and, and does things is working remotely. And, but one of the things we tried to implement was social hours, you know, mm. once or twice a month where everyone can get together after work and at least they can interact with their colleagues mm -hmm. and get that sense of community that yes, they do belong here. They are part of our community and trying to engage them because that that is huge when you feel isolated and on an island that's not a good place to be no and as and as innovative as zoom and this technology that we're using right now the video technology yeah. it's not the same when you it's walk away the from the camera you're i mean depending on your your home environment you may be the only person in that in that building or in that apartment or what have you you know that's very isolating even if you even if you have a family, right? right? It's not the same as as being able to have colleagues that you're going to lunch with or having a a, a quick conversation, you know, mano a mano too. And I remember I used to do walk uh, walk around the office, mm -hmm. and people would just be like, you know, well here comes Jeff, you know, because like I was <laughs> I was going to talk to everybody, and sometimes it would be after hours, and sometimes it'd be early, or so, you know, I'd randomize the time. I would learn so much. Right. And I'd feel, I'd feel lighter. I'd feel like I'd feel good. And then I could also give nice feedback to people. I could, I could learn a few things. I could, and I could just learn about their families. I'd be like, Oh, Hey, did, did your daughter get married yet? Uh, no, no, that's next month. Uh, don't worry. You're going to get an invitation, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, good. Right. We're, uh, you know, if, if it's, you know, if it's as somewhere on the East Coast, we'll be there, you know. And there's, there's the other stressors at home because now you have kid. oftentimes you have a family and kids. During the summer, the kids are there all the time. If they're little kids, they're there all the time. And, you know, you're struggling to try and, you know, keep your kid happy and keep them off the camera and at the same time try and engage and do the stuff you're supposed to do for work. And that's hard. It's actually introducing another stressor on top of, Yeah. So Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot here, right? Sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a, a fastball right down the middle, right? Okay, uh, we'll see see if you can knock this one out of the park. But I imagine, given your experience in the background, that you must have seen some inspiring moments of leadership where 
maybe a leader employ either naturally or maybe through training. I don't know. Use some of these tools specifically to help their team avoid burnout that really you know, made you stand up and go, wow, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Do you, do you have any of those experiences that you yeah. can share with me? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I do at Mail, besides being with the Spine Center, is I, I work tangentially with a group called the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Group. And Dr. Victor Montori, who's one of the most prominent physician researchers on the planet, sort of oversees that group. They, of course, were all forced to work remotely during the pandemic. And he started having, for a while, one-on-one -on -one meetings with every member of the team every week by video to try and talk about any concerns. You know, he would take them out to, to dinner and listen to them and really just try to maximize his engagement with them to try and minimize the effect of working remotely and, and the distance. Wow. That's a huge investment for somebody who has an exceptionally busy schedule. Correct. And, and it's not always, you know, that's, that's an exceptional um, outcome, you know, but other com companies can do other things. So um, in addition to the t traditional C-suite members, there are companies now that are starting to add a chief wellness officer. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, you know, should be by any medium or large company considered. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody who can really have the time then to focus on this stuff without having to ask a CEO or chief operations officer or CFO that's already strained to the gills and busy themselves. Hey, by the way, you need to go do all this other stuff, which is really asking mm -hmm. too much. So, well, and, and not everybody is wired for this stuff. Yeah. You know, 30% of people that burn out said it was due to unrealistic expectations and 62% of people who experienced burnout were struggling with the workload, which just goes back to that, you know, managing, setting up realistic expectations for employees, trying to find out what they do best. Because if you were able to get a person to work on what they do best and what they enjoy, they were 57% less likely to experience burnout. Wow. Again, it's matchups, matching the person with the workload, with the environment, with what they do best. So one of the things that I used to do personally was I would I would establish the what we needed to do as to do, but I'd usually do it amongst my leadership team. Me and my 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 directs would come together and we'd say, What are the pri priorities for the year? Right. But then I, I really said I I can tell you the how, and, and if you need help with the how, I'm sure, like we can mm -hmm. talk about it. There's plenty, but I'd actually like you to, you and your teams to come up with the how behind it. Right. And that, what that released was creative energy. And, mm -hmm. and I will tell you that their how is way better than any how I could have ever come up with. The how they got there was way better and more efficient and creative and innovative and and they did things that would always surprise me. I mean, I, it sounds silly, but it's like when my father-in-law used to go to Christmas and he'd be like, Hey, what I'd get you, what I get you this year for Christmas. You know, <laughs> I felt like that as a leader at times, because it'd be like, Hey, what did, you know, what did you guys come up with? Because they would, they would get so involved in it that, um, that they, they, and then they'd come and unwrap the present and then did this be this amazing idea. And they were in, engaged and involved in it. Like they were personally invested in it and it didn't feel so heavy. It felt lighter to me and to, I think them. I love that when I felt that in within that, my organization. That goes back to the autonomy and some self-determination of what's going on. So one of the things we recommend for solutions to companies is listening sessions, brainstorming, um, having focus groups, get a group of employees together and allow them to list the problems and possible solutions and engage them. Don't just have this top-down approach, um, but you need to make sure it's psychologically safe. I mean, they need to be feel free in those focus groups and in those sessions to be able to say, even things that as a C-suite member, you may not want to hear, but they've got to be able to say it safely. We had one session where we had a guy and one of the best quotes I heard was, the biggest concern for any organization should be when their most passionate people become quiet. Wow. If your passionate workers are all of a sudden not talking, then you have a big problem. 
And you need to prioritize together. You need to figure out, you know, the leadership and the employees have to figure out solutions together. It can't just be one or the other. Oh, that is, that's perfect, Mike. Uh, it, it's just resonates so well with some of uh, my experiences. And I think one of the things that I think about is like where I got it wrong, you can, it's palpable. It's, mm -hmm. it feels heavy. You do, you see, you, you see that passionate people start getting quiet, right? And you start to see people withdrawing from the conversation, maybe backing away from the table. There's all sorts of cues that you're watching. And as a leader, you have to say, am I gonna, am I gonna just keep on, you know, just keep on keeping on? Or am I gonna try to talk about like, hey, Right. I'm sensing that I've I've done something, or we we're, we're, our environment is such that it's creating an unhealthy uh, level of engagement here. And can we just have an open and honest conversation about some of this right. stuff? You yeah. know, maybe set aside some time, and and maybe if I need some feedback, then then give it to me. And yeah. and uh and boy, I tell you, as leaders, that's that's where the humility I think comes in because. Uh, right. We're a lot less perfect than people try to give us credit for, and uh, and 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 if you don't take your own medicine, which is the feedback from your team, then you're right. probably not going to stay very healthy very long. So that's yeah. great advice. Yeah, yeah, and really, you know, coming up with some solutions, but starting on a small scale. So don't try to implement a company wide thing immediately. Um, start with a small pilot and just maybe choose one division or one section and just implement it there and see, okay, reassess six months down the road. What was the impact? Did it really work? Did it help? And then say, okay, maybe now we can, we can, you know, dilute this and put it out throughout the company. Or if it didn't work well, go back to the drawing board and say, okay, well, that didn't really work. Let's, let's try something different. So, that's the point. If you don't, if you don't, if you're not successful, you have the the wonderful gift of learning that comes with it. Right. Actually, right. failure is 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 a gift. It's not a it's it's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. Right. That's great. You know the uh, famous uh, statistician and business owner W. Edwards Deming once said, "85 uh, percent of the reasons for failure are deficiencies in the systems and process rather than the employee." The role of management is to change the processes rather than just badgering individuals to do better. Ah, that is a perfect way to close things up here. That is phenomenal. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, this, you're welcome. this session, I can see a leader taking from this session very specific points on how do you recognize burnout within your within your employee base? What are some specific things that you can do to help avoid? serious consequences of of uh, late stage burnout i guess we can right. call it and then yeah. uh and then how you can even recognize amongst your team and even maybe even in yourself really start by putting the oxygen ma mask on yourself and saying am i feeling burned out right. because if i'm feeling burned out how do i help everybody else if i'm i i need to treat myself first before I Absolutely. move on to, to my team so that I can help be a good shadow of the leader to them. So Absolutely. phenomenal. Thank you, Mike. Any last You're words welcome. that you'd like to do to share with the, the audience? Um, I just think there's, the biggest thing is to recognize that this is a real phenomenon. It can lead to depression, anxiety, and even suicidal ideation. And it's not something to sort of be minimized. There's sometimes, especially among older leaders, this tendency to sort of poo-poo it and suck it up, buttercup. You know, that's the job. You, you, knew, you knew what you were getting when you signed up. Too bad, get it done. And that's not a great attitude. Um, we are in a society at this point where we're trying to look for increased efficiencies, increased ways to produce our products and sell our services. But we have to remember the, the human that's in the middle of all that. And I think that's the thing I would end on. It's the human. So, And that's what this is all about. This is growing your business with people. And the only way you do that is if you take care of the people, like they're the most important thing to you.
and they should be because uh, because that's why we do what we do is for the people. So I'm really appreciative today, uh, Mike. This is a I couldn't have even imagined a better conversation than what we had here. So I want to say thank you for your time, your very precious wow. time. I know you have a ton of you know, patients and research and other responsibilities there at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's just such a phenomenal opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you very much for taking Thank the time. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast, Growing Your Business with People, a podcast where you can get your MBA in TA for senior business leaders. Thank you.